Right now, something is happening in our solar system that's sending scientists scrambling for explanations. The interstellar object NASA's been tracking, 3I Atlas, is roughly the size of Manhattan and has been displaying several unusual movements and features which kind of defy typical behavior of comets. It's even catching the attention of some military analysts. So what does this mean for all of us here on Earth? And what can this mysterious object tell us about what's outside our own solar system? Let's ask physics professor at the City College of New York, and he's a New York Times best-selling author of Quantum Supremacy, Michio Kaku. So this mystery object has been added to the International Asteroid Warning Network. That's, that's the first interstellar object ever to make that list. So I got to ask you, what the heck is 3I Atlas and why... Why the clouds of mystery around it? NASA's like tight-lipped. Well, there's a split, a split in the astronomical community. The majority faction says, what's all the fuss about? I mean, it's just a rock from outer space, and it's going to come through our solar system for the first time and then come whizzing back out again. It's the third, third known object from outside our solar system. So what's the fuss? Another faction, however, says, now, wait a minute. Perhaps this is a visitor, an intelligent visitor from another solar system. And perhaps this week we could have a test of it. That's right. This week, it turns out that the asteroid or comet will be whizzing around our sun. And if it picks up extra energy on its flyby, that would clinch it. That means there's extraterrestrial intelligence involved. So watch for it. On October 30th, starting then, we're going to track it to see whether it gets an extra boost of energy. If so, it means we are being visited. Oh, so, okay, if it's not a giant rock, and it could be a sign of life out there, uh, mm, it, something's got to be steering it, right? Uh, that's right. And as it goes around the sun... There's something called the Oberth effect. The Oberth effect says that if you were to whip around the sun, you would pick up extra energy in the process. So we're going to watch for it. The energy in must equal the energy out, according to the ordinary theory. But if that's not true, if there's more energy going out than in, it means that there's energy boost coming from whipping around the sun, and that requires intelligence. And so that's one acid test that we can make. Watch for it starting this week. We're going to begin to monitor and see whether or not it picks up extra energy as it whips around the sun. So it's Wednesday, right? October 29th, I think it goes the closest point to the sun. Is that right? That's right. That's the perihelion. Okay. And at that point, if it picks up extra energy, that's outside the ordinary bounds of the conservation of energy. So watch for it. As it whips around the sun, if it picks up extra energy, bingo. It means there's intelligent life uh, that is guiding the motion of this object. Uh, this is interesting. I love this stuff. So NASA is launching its Artemis II program in 2026, I think, sending crewed, mission, crewed missions around the moon and then landing on the lunar surface let me ask you, Professor, when do you think that we might see some permanent bases on the moon? Should we? Do we know everything about the moon already or, or not? Certainly the dark side is different. Um, and what about Mars? You think we'll ever set foot on Mars? Well, that's a wish list of, we, of what we have for NASA. However, it's going to take time. Uh, for, for example, we've been talking about going to the moon for decades, and finally it's going to come to pass. Within the next few years, we're going to launch not just an unmanned, a manned probe around the moon, we're going to land on the moon's surface itself. And so this is all on the agenda for NASA in the coming years. And then after that, the next target is going to be Mars. But we'll wait and see. We've had so many setbacks, so many disappointments, but now we think we have the momentum to go on to a flyby around the moon, land on the moon, and then on to Mars. So if I were one of your students, I would go, ooh, 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 like, you know, Arnold Horshack, and ask you, do you think that there is life in the galaxy somewhere, that this could be, what, what do you think it is? What do you think this thing is? 
Well, I'll put my, uh, my, my money on the bet that there is intelligent life throughout the galaxy. Not only that, but I think there's intelligent life in our neighborhood, the neighborhood of the Milky Way galaxy. And so I think that uh, don't, don't necessarily bet, uh, bet the house on it. <laughs> but I would say that, yes, there's intelligent life out there. The big question is, can they visit us? That's the big question, because just to go to uh, the nearest star would take 70,000 years with a conventional rocket. Mm. That's how long it would take just to go to Alpha Centauri. So we need something like warp drive. Now, that, of course, is on the wish list of every science fiction writer. But that's what's required if we're going to meet intelligent life throughout the galaxy. Warp drive. Speaking of Alpha Centauri, maybe it's the Robinson family finally getting back on the Jupiter, too. I don't know. We'll find out. Professor, thank you for, uh, for being interesting, because this stuff can get really in the weeds. But good stuff. Thank you. My pleasure. Anytime.